Hey, on this somewhat rainy day, I'm going to stop by the AACA Museum here in Hershey, Pennsylvania and take a look what we've got. I'll be doing my voiceovers afterwards, so I'm not disturbing other people's museum experiences, but I'm really looking forward to this museum. I've never actually checked it out as many times as I've been to Hershey. Let's start things off by looking at the museum's Tucker collection. Preston Tucker became famous in 1948 by producing the Tucker Model 48. Unfortunately, he was only able to produce 51 cars before being forced into bankruptcy by some questionable legal maneuverings and sensationalist headlines at the time. If you say that the big three automakers forced Preston Tucker out of business because they didn't want the competition, you really wouldn't be too far off here. The very first Tucker prototype was introduced in 1947 with great fanfare. Here's a picture of it being christened right here. So here the museum has actually the very first production Tucker. This is Tucker number 1001. Uh, this varies a little bit from the later production cars. The, uh, the wheel openings were changed. The, uh, the suspension was changed a little bit after this. And, uh, and the front bumper was, was moved out a little bit. But uh, this is it. This is the very first production Tucker car. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful piece of history to see here. This one is not actually a real Tucker. Uh, this is a car that was made for the 1988 movie, Tucker, A Man and His Dream. So this is uh, completely a movie prop. I really like uh, the dash. The dash is just like a, a picture of a dash, not, not an actual dash. Anyway, uh, this was restored by uh, the folks over at the Gilmore Museum uh, after it uh, changed hands uh, several times, including the Ringling Brothers Circus. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a uh, nice little movie prop here. You want more Tuckers? Here's more Tuckers. This one here is Tucker number 26. You see, this has an automatic transmission. That's the Tuckermatic automatic transmission. Uh, the only surviving car that still has one of those. Remember, automatic transmissions were still fairly advanced in 1948. Over here, we've got Tucker number 22. Uh, see the six exhaust pipes down there, because why not? Uh, anyway, uh, Tucker number 22 here uh, is still wearing its original uh, paint in uh, Tucker gray. Uh, this car was loaned out to the movie uh, Tucker, the Man and the Machine, and uh, actually had a little bit of damage on the bumper there. Uh, there's a, a little dent that it still wears that it sustained uh, during filming of that movie. Anyway, nice cars. Here is a 1947 Tucker test chassis number two. Uh, here you can see clearly, if you hadn't picked up on this already, the Tucker is a rear-engined car. Uh, this particular chassis has uh, had the components all uh, painted uh, different colors for, uh, for photographic purposes, in addition to it being a, a test bed. Uh, just a, another rare, rare piece here in the Tucker collection. Here's a shot of a Tucker prototype engine that shows you where they get those six exhaust pipes out of. If you like Tucker engines, uh, we've got actually a whole line of them here at the museum. These are all various uh, prototype engines and uh, transmission assemblies. Uh, just a, an impressive collection of, of, of Tucker engines here. They also have a, a Tucker dealership that's uh, been mocked up here, as well as other Tucker paraphernalia that I, uh, I haven't shown here. There are a lot of other cars in the museum, so let's just look at a couple of them. Uh, I was actually really taken with this uh, 1932 Studebaker, just a really nice car. This one's interesting. This is a 1935 White. Uh, Dr. Louisa Tigley uh, was a lady on the board of directors for White. Uh, so she had them make this car for her. Uh, this is on a white truck chassis and uses a white bus cut down body for the car. Uh, so this was specially built uh, just for her. The museum has a number of these uh, little uh, building mock-ups. Uh, this one's a, uh, a gas station. Uh, they've got another one that is a diner, another one that is a, a hotel. Uh, but uh, just a couple of nice little uh, features that add some overall ambiance to the museum. Uh, just, uh, just uh, I don't know, a lot of work went into these. 1966 Olds Tornado. I always liked these things. Uh, nice design. Uh, shared the E platform with the Cadillac Eldorado and the Buick Riviera. But uh, I think this is the prettiest out of the three. Here's a 1969 AMC AMX with Go Pack Performance Package and Big Bad Paint Scheme. 
Nice car. Here's a Datsun 280Z. This is 1978. Here's a 1950 Pontiac. I always like the Pontiacs because they have this uh, chrome strip down the center of the hood. That was a kind of a Pontiac feature for a lot of years, uh, all the way up until uh, the, the mid-50s. And uh, over here behind it, we've got a, a 1970 uh, Plymouth uh, GTX. No big deal, just a, just a GTX sitting there. Uh, anyway, a lot of nice cars here. They've got them kind of set up watching a movie. Here we've got a 1927 Packard. Very large car. Uh, there's the uh, signature Packard tombstone shaped grill, but just a really big car. And for contrast, they got it sitting next to a really small car. Here's a 1961 Nash. A uh, good photo op with the flamingos back there. Here's a 1957 DeSoto Fire Dome Sportsman uh, with those uh, nice 1957 fins. Uh, DeSoto just high key was on point with their with their 1950s designs. Also their names, you just can't beat those DeSoto names. Uh, this is a nice car. I would drive it home. All right, I have to confess, this was my dream car in high school. This is a 1981 uh, DeLorean DMC 12. Just a very nice car. Less than 500 miles on the odometer on this one. But next to it, next to it, we've got something special. This is a 1978 DeLorean prototype uh this is a one of one and this is actually rear engine uh this has a uh, v6 in the rear uh with uh with a number of other little modifications from the actual production car but this is something special here's a 1912 delunier belleville uh, this is a uh, french manufactured car a uh, very expensive limousine this is a 4400 pound car with a top speed of 70 miles an hour in 1912 Sorry. Uh, just a neat, neat front end. Uh, body is by uh, Brewster. That's a uh, that's a U.S. coach building company. Here is the 1896 Benton Harbor. This is the first vehicle in America to be purpose built as a uh, automobile and not a converted carriage. Although it still retains a lot of carriage features, like the carving on the side and the leather dashboard, uh, has a tiller steering. And uh, if you look in there, uh, that actually is a candle lighting in the, uh, in the carriage lamps. Uh, this vehicle is very significant and is on the National Historic uh, Vehicle Register uh, as uh, one of the earliest automobiles in the country. Uh, underneath there, there is a horizontally imposed uh, seven and a half horsepower engine, but uh, just a very nice, very rare car here. Hey, speaking of historic vehicles, here's a 1966 Volkswagen bus that was owned by Esau and Janie B. Jenkins uh, for the Progressive Club around Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, the Progressive Club was started in 1948 to help uh, poverty-stricken uh, African Americans and other residents uh, in uh, whatever way they could. Just a nice vehicle. Here we have an entire machine shop uh, set up off of a line shop. Sorry for the glare, everything is behind glass. But anyway, all of the machinery uh, attaches to belts that all run off of these lines that are powered by a single motor. Uh, that's actually where we get the terms coming online and offline is, is off that line shaft. When you disengage from it, you're off the line. Uh, over here next to it, we've got a, a 1911 Buick Model 26 uh, kind of set up in a little, uh, a little shop here. Uh, make it look like it's uh, undergoing repairs. So, uh, I don't know, it makes people like me feel more at home. Uh, yeah, I think I actually have that compressor. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, nice little car. Here is a 1982 AMC Eagle. When I lived in Michigan's Upper Peninsula in the 1980s, they loved these things. This is a high ground clearance, four-wheel drive station wagon. There is no word in there that you do not like. These things were super cool at the time. Everyone loved them in the far north. I love them to this day. I find them to just be super cool cars. I will fight anyone who disagrees. Look at that interior. Mmm, brown. The museum actually has an impressive display of uh, scooters and uh, motorcycles. A lot, of, a lot of motorcycles in the basement, along with a lot of ATVs. Here's a 1960 harley davidson topper uh this is harley davidson's entry into the scooter market i hear a lot about these i see a lot of them but i really seldom see them actually in person so so this is kind of a treat to actually see a uh, see a harley davidson topper 
Over here, we've got a, uh, a 1962 Vespa, uh, just classic Vespa lines. Everybody loves the Vespa. Uh, speaking of Vespas, this is actually a 1959 Allstate. Now, Allstate was the Sears house brand. And what this is, this is a rebadged Vespa. Uh, Sears purchased uh, Vespas in bulk, rebadged them as Allstate. Here's a 1947 Cushman uh, sidecar utility. I just kind of have a fondness for Cushmans. I just like them. They're very uh, utilitarian looking. Uh, I just like them. Uh, over next to it is a 1906 Waltham Orient uh, with a wooden body. Uh, this was actually owned by one of the founders of the AACA. Uh, he used it for advertising for his business and kind of attracted other antique car uh, enthusiasts, and uh, they founded the club. Here's a 1921 Evans uh, motorcycle. Uh, actually, a little crude for 1921s uh, when you consider what uh, some of the other manufacturers were doing. Uh, this is actually uh, pedal-driven, and uh, then, uh, of course, you have a belt drive back there for the motor. Uh, but uh, this is uh, just sort of a quick and dirty motorcycle when you compare it to Harley. Here is a 1945 Harley Davidson knucklehead. This is California Highway Patrol. Uh, this is a documented, authentic uh, CHP bike. Uh, there on the crossbar, we've got a uh, roll with uh, with radio information. Uh, just a just a nice original bike that you don't see anymore. Uh, there on the front, we've got uh, the original uh, California lights. Uh, not something you want to see in your rear view mirror, uh, uh, but nice to see now. Uh, this is actually documented as the last remaining 1945 uh, CHP motorcycle. Uh, so, so this is just a rare bike to see. Nice to see it. They actually have a pretty extensive motorcycle display. Uh, this is just some of them. There you see a uh, 1941 Indian back there. A uh, number of uh, Suzuki's and things from all eras, uh, something for everyone. They also have a very extensive collection of ATVs, which is uh, sort of a surprise. Uh, not really my thing, but you know, everything doesn't have to be about me, although I do like... Uh, like Here's a here. 1970 Honda with an aftermarket Bandito frame and uh, later 1980s engine. Early ATVs in, uh, in unmolested condition are kind of rare. Here's a 1930 DuPont with very desirable wood light headlights, which matching wood light uh, fender light lights too. Uh, over here next to it, we've got a 1956 Chevy Cameo pickup truck, kind of a kind of a more of an upscale pickup truck. Here is a 1906 Paragon. Uh, this is a, a lower-end car for its time, as you can see from its, uh, its smaller size. Uh, if we look through the, uh, the front grille there, we can, uh, we can see the engine. Uh, so that's just all air-cooled. Uh, nice little uh, flywheel under there. Here's a super nice LaSalle. Uh, LaSalle was a General Motors brand that really was cars. kind of priced really as the lower-priced companion car to, really to Cadillac. Uh, still a very high-quality car. Uh, behind it, we've got a 1914 Overland, uh, Overland, uh, part of the Willys Overland family of cars, uh, but just a nice couple of cars. Here's a 64 Corvair owned by Raymond Lowy. Yes, that Raymond Lowy. The industrial designer that was so good that if you don't like one of his designs, you need to reevaluate your taste. Anyway, Mr. Lowy lived in New York City and needed a limousine that could navigate the New York City streets. So he got this Corvair and modified it with lower floors, higher roof line, and extended doors. Also added this tasteful basket weave design on the back, although it retains the original Corvair drivetrain. Uh, this is something that I've never seen or heard of before, but just a fantastic piece. So here is a 1919 Briggs and Stratton motor wheel. Uh, that's the motor wheel part there in the back. Uh, that fifth wheel, just a little motor with a gas tank that runs that wheel. Uh, the rest of this is just a very, very bare bones car. Uh, all those parts are, uh, are all that there is to the actual motor wheel uh, part of that. I, I see these things show up at, at car shows just because they're so uh, so simple that it seems like a lot of them survive. There's a 1917 Pierce Arrow. Uh, this features the Pierce Arrow trademark for many, many years of the headlights kind of flared into the fenders. You can see it there. Hey, speaking of recognizable design features, here's a 1929 Stearns Knight. <clears throat> and uh, their feature was always this white trim that outlined the radiator. Whenever you see this, you know you're dealing with a Stearns Knight. 
uh, you can see the same thing over here on this uh, 1917 Stearns Knight. Um, and, uh, and once again over here on this 1925. They started this feature in uh, 1913, uh, so you're not going to see it over here on this next car, which is a 1912 Stearns Knight. Uh, Stearns Knights are kind of rare. You don't really see them out to, uh, to car shows. Kind of a higher-end car, but, uh, but they are around, uh, as you can uh, see. Here's, uh, here's four very nice ones. Here's a 1917 Pierce Arrow Model 66. Uh, this does not have the, uh, the standard Pierce Arrow headlights on there. This car actually features the largest displacement engine on any American passenger car at 825 cubic inches. Uh, this is a seven-passenger uh, touring car. You see the, uh, the fold-down seats in there. Uh, so you have a full three rows of seating along with uh with two spare tires back there uh rubber back in the day was not as good as it is today so multiple spare tires are often on cars here's a 1956 scenic cruiser bus uh, these were built by gm exclusively for greyhound buses at the time although uh in later years they continued service with other bus lines uh, these things were the bus of the 50s uh, this is one of the few remaining that still have the original seats. A lot of these have survived, but have seen conversions of one kind or another. Uh, so let's uh, let's go in here and take a look at what it's like to actually ride on one of these. It's uh, it's actually surprisingly cramped in here, but uh, the real bonus is uh, when we walk up the stairs and are able to look out that scenic cruiser windshield. Yeah, oh, there it is right there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is the height of bus luxury in the 1950s with slide open windows. Just a, just a nice, nice bus and uh, nice uh, mid-century travel here with uh, your luggage compartment uh, just up above. Uh, this is just something that you don't see and uh, you don't really get aboard buses. Hey, that's not the only bus that the museum has. Actually, they have uh, several buses here. Uh, this is a 1929 yellow coach. Uh, this is a Model W that was apparently used for uh, shorter uh, routes or, uh, or interurban. Uh, so uh, this is sort of a medium-sized bus. Uh, this Model W features a rear observation area. Uh, so it's got a little ladder up there uh, for uh, the luggage area, but also some extra uh, brackets and uh, lighting back here uh, for the observation model. Over here we've got a 1927 uh, Fagiol, if I'm uh, pronouncing that right. I always have trouble with that name. Uh, anyway, uh, this one was operated originally around the Spokane, Washington area uh, as, a, uh, as an interurban bus and uh, has been restored uh, very nicely. Uh, as we move back around here, uh, we've got a 1924 uh, white. Uh, we had the yellow earlier, and now this is the white. And this was actually operated originally by Yellowstone uh, Park System as a as a tour bus there. So uh, we've got uh, uh, one, two, three, four rows of seats on this. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, that's a uh, that's a nice little uh, bus there. I did want to show you the really cool wicker seats in the Fagil. Uh, this is just a uh, super cool. Parked outside the museum, they've got this 1935 yellow coach, which is really nice. Also, this 1940s uh, flexible. I'm not sure of the exact year. Uh, there's no, no signage on it, but uh, really nice lines on this bus. Uh, it's just a, just a cool streamlined look. And, of course, uh, out front and in front of the museum, we've got this uh, uh, late 40s or 1950s uh, GM coach. That's, that's kind of their signature bus next to their sign. So that was the AACA Museum in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Actually a pretty worthwhile museum if you're ever in the area. Stop by, great collection, especially the Tucker stuff. If you're into Tuckers, this is just out of this world. We'll talk to you later. Bye.